we've talked in here before about how Christianity is really not a religion about the life we live on earth today. It's a religion about the eternal life that we will one day have in heaven. However, even though that is the case, Christianity does have relevance to the things that we face in this life. And there is something in the news now that I know some of you have been concerned about, and, and we have talked about this issue in here before, but it's been a good while ago, and it wasn't really on the radar back then, but it is today. And that is the issue of abortion. And I know that it's been in the news recently because there is an important case before the United States Supreme Court, and I know that some of you are concerned about it and are wondering about it, and so I thought it would be good to talk about it today. As I said, we've talked about this before, but it was a long time ago, and I know that people are concerned about it today. Now, abortion, of course, has been a hot topic for years and years and years in this country, and because of that, it's hard to find out exactly how many abortions there are in the United States every year. The government tends to collect data on it, but a lot of abortion providers do not release their numbers, and a lot of states will not release their numbers, but from what I've been able to find out, there are about one million abortions performed in the United States every year, and that represents one in five pregnancies. So that means that one in five pregnancies in the United States today are terminated by abortion, and the vast majority of those are for other than medical reasons. Most Americans do not believe abortion should be permitted in all circumstances, and neither do they believe abortion should be illegal in all circumstances. Most Americans believe abortion should be permitted in some circumstances. And while most Americans' views on abortion are somewhat divided along party lines, there are conservatives who favor wide latitude in abortion, and there are liberals who favor tight restrictions, so there is no agreement within American society on abortion, and it's not necessarily divided on party lines. And just as in society as a whole, Christianity is divided on abortion. Some Christians categorically oppose it. Other Christians, though, are in the forefront supporting abortion. And so it's just like everything else, Christians are divided on it. This is one of those things we cannot turn to the Bible for help with because the Bible doesn't mention it. And the reason for that is simple. It wasn't an issue back then. Abortion that is able to be a safe and effective option is a product of modern medicine, and that is a product of the 20th century. Historians tell us that for most of recorded history, women have faced unwanted pregnancies and have tried to end them and various methods have been tried but they were in general either not successful or they would end up killing the woman. In biblical times there were no safe and effective means of abortion. Various things might have been tried but they just didn't work. The fact is that abortion as a reasonable choice where it's safe and effective is a product of the 20th century and the Bible doesn't mention it simply because it wasn't on the radar screen back then. It just, it just wasn't an option. Now, going outside of the Bible, there is no historical evidence that abortion was a reasonable option at any time until the advent of modern medicine. Modern medicine is what brought abortion to us, and you need to think about that. You know, I know some people will say, now wait a minute, abortion was accepted in the ancient world and women just had them all the time. You know? Well, yeah, you just think about it. If it was so easy to get abortion the way you could do it with the medical technology they had 2,000 years ago, just like if you could just take a few herbs and set them like that, that's what people would do today. And there would be an issue. People would just do it in the privacy of their own homes and nobody would ever know about it. It never would come up. So, you know, the fact is that abortion that's safe and effective enough to be a viable option is a product of the 20th century. And so what we have here is an issue the Bible does not address, an issue that was not even on the radar screen in biblical time. And so people have looked 
for other ways to come up with the position on abortion using the Bible. And up until about 30 years ago within Christianity, the debate about abortion centered on the question of when human life begins. Now the Bible doesn't mention abortion, but it does prohibit murder. And so if human life begins at conception, then abortion could be considered taking a human life, and it could be considered murder. And so, if it's not taking a human life, though, it wouldn't be considered murder. So when does human life begin? Does it begin at conception? Does it begin at some point during the development of the pregnancy? Or does it begin once the baby's born and starts breathing? Now, it doesn't matter which of those positions you want to take. You can go to the Bible and pick out two or three verses and say, okay, you see, I'm going to say it begins at conception. I mean, look at this verse right here. That's what it says. <clears throat> and somebody else says, no, I'm going to say it begins at a certain point of development. And here's a verse I can change. And then somebody else says, no, no, no. Human life begins when the baby is born and takes its first, first breath. And there are passages in the Bible you can use to support that too. The fact is that we cannot find one definitive answer in the Bible of when human life begins. No matter what passage you point to, you're using an interpretation to come up with that. <clears throat> and someone else can point to something different. The Bible does not clearly state when a human life begins. And so we cannot go to the Bible and find out if abortion is the murder of a human being or not. So what has happened then is that some people have just said, well, my position is human life begins at conception and I'll let the matter rest. Other Christians have said, no, human life, this, what is genuinely human life, begins at some other point later. And they are therefore supportive of abortion. That is where the majority of mainline Christianity falls today. It's denominations like Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and increasingly Baptist. And these Christians comprise some of the most ardent supporters of abortion today. I wanted to talk a little bit about how that happened. How did it get to where Christians? are some of the most ardent supporters of abortion. It has to do with something called stewardship. The idea of stewardship says that God gives each individual certain gifts and abilities. And it is that individual's responsibility to use their God-given gifts and abilities in the best possible way. That's the idea of stewardship. God has given you certain gifts and abilities and blessing, and you're supposed to go out and use what God has given you in the best possible way. And that's how the mainline churches first started talking about abortion, that it was an issue of stewardship. And if a woman found herself pregnant, she would ask herself if it were the best use of her gifts and abilities to bear the child. If the answer was yes, she should bear the child. If no, she can have an abortion. But there was a big problem with this that soon cropped up. Keep in mind that stewardship says that you are required to use your gifts and abilities in the best way. That's what God expects of you. And so when you look at it, abortion in the context of stewardship, you're not giving anybody a choice. You're actually putting a woman in a position of where you're telling her what she should do. And so supporters of abortion found that they really weren't giving anybody a choice. The argument for abortion as a matter of stewardship didn't last very long, and it was soon dropped in favor of another argument. And this argument is the reason many mainline denominations support abortion today. Abortion is seen, first of all, as a women's rights issue. Within mainline Christianity today, it is popular to see women as being historically oppressed by men. And in connection with that, pregnancy 
childbearing, and motherhood are seen as a sentence more or less imposed on women by men. And so pregnancy and bearing a child becomes a symbol of oppression by men. And abortion represents women being able to free themselves of the sentence of pregnancy, childbearing, and motherhood that is forced on them by men. It allows a woman to determine when she will bear a child and not have that decision forced upon her when a man's sperm happens to fertilize one of her eggs. And so abortion represents a way for women to free themselves of oppression by men, and this is the primary reason so much of mainline Christianity today is supportive of abortion. But of course we all know practically nobody pays any attention to what those churches say anymore, and nobody really cares what they think anymore. And so the situation we find in Christianity today is that some Christians are categorically opposed to abortion. Some Christians basically think it's okay whenever you want to do it. But most people don't know what to think. And it seems to be that group of don't know what to think that takes the position that abortion is acceptable under some circumstances. The disagreement lies under exactly what circumstances are permissible. And that's what most Christians today cannot agree on, exactly what circumstances make abortion morally acceptable. Now that's within Protestant Christianity, of course. If you go to Roman Catholic Christianity, they have a history of being in the forefront of opposing abortion. It's interesting to note, though, that their position does not have anything to do with women's rights, it does not have anything to do with when human life begins. Catholics believe God is behind the conception of every child. No child, under whatever circumstances, is ever conceived unless God specifically directs it. There are no accidental pregnancies. Every pregnancy results only because God directs it. And so, if you have an abortion, you're standing in the way of God's will because God has directed a pregnancy and he wants that child and you have gone in and terminated it. That, by the way, is also the basis for the Catholic opposition to birth control. Now, one of the things that makes the issue of abortion so difficult is that the desire to have a child is completely unconnected with the desire to do the act that makes a child. A child is conceived through sex, and the sex drive is completely unconnected to the desire to have a child. And that means that the desire to have a child and the desire to do the act that results in a child are two completely different things and totally unconnected. There's no connection between the desire to have sex and the desire to have a child. It's just two separate things. Now, while unwanted pregnancies have occurred throughout history, there are factors unique to American society today that make unwanted pregnancies especially difficult. In the teens and twenties, hormones are raging. The sex drive is the strongest. And in earlier times, that's when people got married, in the teens. It was not unusual to get married at 15 or 16 years old. And so at the time when your sex drive was the highest is the time when you were married and wanted to have children. But the way our society is set up today, adulthood, is delayed into the mid-twenties or later. So that having a child today is something best put off until you're 25 or 30 years old. After you've graduated from high school, graduated from college, maybe graduated from graduate school, gotten a job, established yourself in a career. And then by the time you're 25, 30 years old, maybe you think about having a child. But remember the sex drive is the strongest in the late teens and early twenties. 
And that's when society, the way it's set up today, makes it most inconvenient to bear a child. And that puts people in a bad situation. Their hormones are raging and their sex drive is strong, but yet bearing a child is not reasonable. Marriage rates among the middle class in the United States have been on the decline for 40 years. More and more young adults either live alone or live with their parents. More and more young adults are in unmarried relationships that typically do not last long. Real incomes of the middle class have been declining for some time. And many middle class young adults simply cannot afford to marry and raise a family. We live in a society today where things work very, very well for a handful of people, where things work reasonably well for some people, but we live in a society today where for an increasing number of people things don't work well at all. And many middle class young adults simply cannot afford to marry and raise a family. And so our society has created the conditions such that marrying or raising a family is not an option for a growing number of young adults. And you can see the situation this creates. You have this sex drive that's almost overpowering when you're a teenager in your early 20s. But the sex drive is totally separate from the desire to have a child. And as a result, women are getting pregnant who are not in a position to raise a child. 85% of abortions are in unmarried women. 60% of abortions are women in their 20s. It's difficult to get statistics on abortions for women age, under age 20. But it's obvious that the vast majority of abortions occur in unmarried women under the age of 30. So what do you do? Is it reasonable to expect people to abstain from sex during the years when their sex drive is the strongest? Is it really reasonable to create a society where adulthood is not reached until you're like 30 years old? Is that reasonable? There's something else to think about. The commandment we read from our Bible, thou shalt not kill, is literally thou shalt not murder. <coughs> Killing is not prohibited in the Bible. Murder is. The difference is that murder, from a technical legal standpoint, is defined as killing someone with malice. In other words, with the intention to do harm. There are numerous instances in the Bible where killing is not convenient. In fact, there are instances in the Bible where killing is commanded by God. And that includes the killing of children. In the book of Joshua, when the Hebrews enter the promised land, and take it over town by town. God commands them to kill every inhabitant in the town, young and old, men and women, children alike. And that's what they do. There are other instances of God commanding people to kill children throughout the Old Testament. What in the world do you do with that? I guess that's a subject for another day, but if we're going to look at the Bible as we have it today, Old Testament and you, you cannot say that killing, even the killing of children, is always wrong. And before we get too upset about God commanding it in the Old Testament, we need to look in the mirror, because we do it too. Think about the Lord. One and I always get a Germany calendar every year to go in our bathroom closet, so we have the door, and you know, we've been there a number of times. We lost one of them had a picture of Dresden in there, the Elbe River in the banks of the Elbe River. And one time when we were in Dresden, we were very fortunate to run into a woman that was old, and we were standing there talking to her, and she remembered the firebombing of Dresden, February 14, 1945. And she said that she lived about 20, 30 miles on the other side of Dresden, and it just lit up the sky for two days. And then back then, although they have repaired a lot of Dresden from that, there's still some that they haven't. And there's still some buildings there that still bombed out. And there was a guy, it was a street artist doing charcoal street art, and we've got in our living room a, a sketch that he did of this building. One had been restored and one hadn't, and they're side by side. And in that picture, in that calendar on the Elbe River, I see that's the same 
did what we've got him in that picture in the living room in one place. And so you see what happened was when Allied forces firebombed Dresden and other German cities in World War II, a lot of children were killed. A lot of people who were against Adolf Hitler were killed. And our military leaders knew that was going to happen. But they said, well, that's an acceptable price to pay for defeating Adolf Hitler. Anytime we use military force, we know that innocent people are going to get killed, even children. It hasn't been very long ago. Or they finally admitted when they had to that a recent drone strike in Afghanistan killed a bunch of children. And so anytime we use military force, lots of innocent people die. Thousands of children were dying in car wrecks this year. And we know that. But we don't take all cars off the road. The deaths of those children are part of the price we're willing to pay to have transportation. It's part of the cost of having cars on the road. And we accept it. You see, we accept death and killing, even of children, as the acceptable price for some things. And we're willing to do it. Some people consider the question of abortion in the same way. Whether or not abortion is the murder of a human being can be open to question if you're just looking at the Bible. But whether or not it is killing is not open to question. Abortion is killing. And so, since we sometimes do accept killing in our society, even the killing of children, are the advantages abortion brings worth the killing it entails? I guess that's what you have to think about. Abortion is a difficult issue. One which, when you consider all the factors, there is no easy answer. And the Bible doesn't speak of it. It doesn't give clear guidance so that there's no way we can come up with what we could call the Christian position. Of course, I have my own personal opinion on it. But you know, as a minister, it's not my job to present my personal opinion. It's my job to present what the Bible says. And I can tell you from my study of the Bible, I do not see a definitive answer one way or the other. I have my opinion about what I think of it, but you've got to realize that my position on it comes from a position that's different than most people. You see, one, and I don't have any children. That means that we'll never have a child or a grandchild that has to make that decision. We'll never have to do that. I'll never have to be involved with making that decision with any close family member. Any involvement I'll ever have with abortion is at arm's length. Our granddaughter will never come into our house one night and say, I'm pregnant, don't know what to do. So we'll never have to face that situation. Now, you know, abortion is an example of why technology, of how technology, with its fast pace, has made things possible that create ethical dilemmas. The fast pace of technology is making things possible that create ethical dilemmas. It's sort of like feeding tubes, life support, organ transplantation, <coughs> remote control warfare. You see, the pace of technology makes things possible faster than our ability to sit down and ethically think about them, faster than our ability to determine the morality of things. Technology forces stuff on us, can do this, that, or the other at such a rapid pace. And we don't have time to just sit back and say, okay, wait a minute. Do we really want to do this? Do we really want to get involved in this? That's the problem that we face in society today, is that technology is making all these things possible before we ever have a chance to sit down and really think about them from a moral and ethical standpoint. Abortion is one of those things. It creates a situation unique to the modern world that the Bible does not address. We have to get an answer some other way. You know, one thing I wanted to bring up about abortion is something I've seen happen in a lot of situations. You sometimes see 
a person in general opposed to this, that, or the other. But when their daughter or their granddaughter does it, it's always a little different. Isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's easy to criticize somebody else's child for doing something. But when it's yours, it's always just a little different. It's not nearly as bad. Not nearly as bad. I know a woman whose nephew got a girl pregnant when the girl was 15 years old and they had a baby. And when this woman would come down to the house, she would not enter the house when the baby was in the house because it was an illegitimate child. Her son today has two illegitimate children. But that's different, you see. That's different. It's always different when it's your child. So maybe we need to use the standards for everybody else's children that we use for our own. Things like goals, maybe. But since we can't go to the Bible and get a definitive answer, we might turn to something Jesus said. Seek and you will find. Ask and you will receive. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. I would suggest that's what you do with abortion. I would suggest if you're concerned about it right now, and I know some of you are, you just simply ask God to show you and lead you to the right viewpoint on it. And I think God will do that. I really do think if we genuinely go to God and ask for guidance, not with our mind made up, but if we genuinely go open to hearing what God says to us, God will work within our hearts in some way and speak to us and let us know what we should think and how we should act in all situations.